Can't hear you. I'm not used to having to unmute when I join a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> good evening. Narrative. <laughs> I'm awake. I'm I'm good. I should have had a drink. That's what I should have done. I have mine. <laughs> what is it? Uh, whiskey and coffee. <laughs> nice. I so I, well, I recently moved um, so that I could help take care of my mom. And when my wife and I were packing, we found so much alcohol in our house. <laughs> it was a pretty big house. And I'd lived there for like 19 years. And we found just so much wine and hard liquor. And we were like, man, we need to drink a lot more. <laughs> uh, so my plan is just grab something out of a box. And, and if it's wine, you just drink it. But if it's uh, liquor, then I got to make something out of it. You know, I have to, I have to do something with it. And Dessert. so we, well, we made, uh, <laughs> we made, we do a lot of cooking and baking and we, we uh, grow a lot of food. So we made a uh, blackberry syrup and a peach syrup. Ooh. And we were using that with a lot of booze, you know, turned out great. Nice. Nice. I like it. <laughs> Helpful That's... hint. So, yeah. well, Drink often. You're, not, That's my... you're not the only one. Uh, trust <laughs> me. I, I, when I moved, I had a neighbor who worked for a, a brewery and she gave me so much. She was a consultant and she gave me, I think it was something like 35 bottles of wine from all over the wow. world. And I was, I was ecstatic at the time, mind you. So I ate a lot of dessert and forgot about the wine. Every time I would buy a dessert, I would think, oh, it's going to go perfect with this, you know, with this type or whatnot. Had this big master plan. Yeah. Never worked out. I ended up pulling all these bottles out going, oh my God, I am the worst drunk ever. <laughs> No, that's yeah. my story. <laughs> I get it. No, I was like, we do not drink enough. And, yeah. <laughs> but, but moving in with my parents and helping take care of them has inspired us to drink. Aha. Uh -huh. So. Gotcha. <laughs> well, yeah. are we ready to get started? Of course. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am Opus Knight, and you have entered Night Vision. And tonight we have Ron Lear. Is that how we say your name? No. I'm no. totally off. How do we say your name? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Lar. Ron Lar. We're very Lar. close. Lar. I, yes. I would have never guessed. Never guessed in a thousand years. I swear to God. It's, just so you know, it is L-A-H-R. Right, so the uh, A H is ah, uh, like lar. Ah. Uh. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us what's been going on in your life. Well, today has actually been uh, very exciting. I finished the first draft of book three of the Cathaldi Chronicles today, only like a year plus behind schedule, my original plan. Um, but I'm that was a huge weight off of my shoulders having that done it comes out next month on the 18th i have another book coming out before that but this was the last i i have four books coming out this year and this was the last first draft i had to get done so now it's just easy street editing yeah. and rewriting and and everything else in life but but the pressure of the first drafts is over except for one short story for an anthology. And other than that, I'm feeling very relieved. There's a lot of work to do, but this is a big day for me. So congratulations to me. So yay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm in a great mood. I haven't hit my wife. I haven't done anything. Yet. Awesome. No, I'm just kidding. She's, <laughs> she hasn't even. <laughs> I know you're she joking. Hasn't even been home. Yeah. Relax, I everybody. Am. He's joking. <laughs> I mean, it is true. I have not hit my wife ever. But anyway. Probably kick your butt. <laughs> yeah, oh, my God. Yeah. Her mom. Her mom is terrifying. So even if I wanted to, which I 
don't want to because my wife is awesome. Mm -hmm. But even if I wanted to, I wouldn't because I'm afraid of her mom. Aha. Uh -huh. So yay to mom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So do you have one of your books, preferably your first draft that you can read a line from? Sure. Just something exciting here. You know, something I'm exciting. I don't know. That's uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, like I've even looked at the, the beginning of it in a long time. I've uh, mostly looked at the end. Sorry, I got to move it to my other monitor. Let's see here. Let me see. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll read you just the beginning of book three. So, so these are first person and the, the character that is telling the story. And it is very much like you're at a bar and he's just telling you the story. It's very conversational, but he also starts off each book discussing the books. Um, so this is the beginning of book three, Destroyers of Cathaldi. Look, I think it's fairly obvious that I'm just writing these things for the money. Also gotcha. the fame and attention, but mostly the money. <laughs> the hero business hasn't turned out to be quite as lucrative as I was hoping. Not that I'm hurting for money, but I still don't have the palace I was hoping to receive as a reward for saving the world. Hmm. It looks like I'm gonna have to buy one for myself. And since my old line of work is off the table, I'm really counting on book sales to get me over the top palace wise. That being the yeah. case, I want to thank you for purchasing this book and remind you to make sure that you've also bought the other books in the series. Also, don't forget that some holiday, birthday, or other cause for celebration is coming up, and these books make an excellent gift. All right, enough of that. Perfect. And then, <laughs> then, then it goes into the recap of it. But that's the tone he takes in the books. Um, yeah, so thank you. That was fun. Wrote that a long time ago. <laughs> uh, that draft took a long time. So, well, I, yeah. so okay. what is it? It's question time. So what exactly is it that you find so interesting about being a writer? Well, that's a toughie. Um, I love it. I mean, I, I started writing when I was in high school. Um, and I, I just always saw myself as a writer. And then those stupid kids happened and I had to feed them and stuff. Um, so I, I took like 30 years off to, to raise my kids and um, work on my career, my career, my career I hated. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know if it's a matter of it being interesting so much as it is just, you know, what I want to do. I mean, I did it anyway, even when I wasn't trying to do it to publish, I still wrote all the time, but not, I mean, <clears throat> you know, I would write for newsletters or, I mean, I wrote a lot of kind of reporting stuff, but um, I was always writing, but yeah, interesting. I don't know that it is particularly interesting. So At least not the way I do it. <laughs> so what was the other career? Because I know I'm going to be asked. Oh, well, I... I was an IT guy. Um, and so I, I was a network administrator. Then I was an IT manager. Then an IT director. Then I became a consultant because money is so awesome. And they give consultants a lot of money. So I traveled all over, all over North America. I didn't travel out of the continent. Um, and I helped, most of the time, I, I helped people, manufacturing companies mainly, install the software that runs their business, shipping, receiving, production, accounting, everything. So, and, and a little bit of management consulting. But uh, yeah, so... That is why I always wear, you can't really tell, but that's why I always am wearing a sports coat because I have like 20 some sports coats for my consulting career. And I'm like, I got to get some use out of these bad boys. <laughs> write something with them. I think you can, you might be able to write it off. <laughs> I think. You got to be in the, in the uniform now, you know, come on. <laughs> 
Well, I was on I, another show and everybody wore t-shirts except for me and I'm wearing, I'm wearing this and, and this one of the co commenters, you know, a, somebody watching it was commenting and making fun of me for dressing up. And I said, you know, I dress up because I respect the host and I respect the other panelists. And I just want to thank all of you for showing me respect by wearing your finest t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the guys, he had like stains on his t-shirt. I mean, he hadn't done anything to look nice. And anyway, um, at least they well, laughed. They didn't. I they bet that would never well. <laughs> They, they laughed. They didn't realize how serious I was. That's the great thing about writing humor is you can say anything and people think you're joking, even if you totally mean it. I believe it. I believe it. I've known I've known more than a few uh, comedic personalities. And yeah, I know when they're serious and I'll just kind of like wink at them and they'll, they'll just look at me and, you know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Gotta love it. <laughs> so. Back to the story. You said it took you a year and a half to actually write this, the book? It did. Um, there was a lot of, well, of course, COVID. <laughs> I mean, a lot, of, a lot of stuff happened there. But also my mom has Alzheimer's. And, I mean, you know, it's progressive. It doesn't, it doesn't ever get better. It just might, you can maybe slow down the, the speed of the, you know, the progression of the disease. So that happened. Um, and then my mom had some, some mini strokes. Oh. And, and so she also has now, in, in addition to Alzheimer's, she has vascular dementia. So she is, she's pretty bad. Um, like uh, my grandma, her mom, my maternal grandmother had Alzheimer's. And I thought, this was going to be like that. So we move in to help out and it is so much worse. I mean, she, she doesn't remember how to do anything um, almost. Uh, so like you, she wants to help. So you're like, why don't you come help me plant potatoes? We have a giant garden. Mm -hmm. We planted like a hundred potato plants. So we got between 600 and a thousand potatoes this year. Um, I might be insane. That's a lot of potatoes. But anyway, I asked her to come up with me to help. And basically, I would dig a hole. And then we would put in some compost. And then I'd put in the seed potatoes. And then I would fill it in. Mm -hmm. And her job was to put in the compost. So I'm doing three of the four things. Mm -hmm. She's got one thing to do. She has no idea from time to time. And it's like a few seconds. Because I would dig a whole row. And then we would go hold the hole. And she would have no idea how much to put it in or what hole we were at. And I mean, you can see, and then we would move right to it. And immediately I would say, okay, put it in, which one? So, I mean, it, it's a stunning level of, I don't know, of needing help, guidance. So, I mean, you, you really, you can't leave her alone mm -hmm. for a second. Um, Yes, it is. Uh, it's very stressful, <laughs> especially for me, because I cook and bake from scratch a lot. So does my wife. I mean, we love food. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why I weigh what I weigh. We love food. Well, she, she can't really wash her hands. She can't operate a soap dispenser. I mean, so she's not very clean with her hands. And we have a lot of animals. And then she'll touch everything like that I'm using to cook or so I'm constantly washing it. My hands are like the skin is falling off because I'm washing my hands so much and washing so many dishes. And then I, and if she comes around me when I'm doing any of this, I get real paranoid because if I don't see her touch something, you know, it could affect me. And I have some germ issues, you know, mm. I mean, I have a lot of issues, but the ones that are relevant to this story are the germ issues. Anyway, all the time that I've spent helping my mom and then uh, my dad is still about 80 and they have some property so there, there's a lot of work around the place and then I was working I'm not working right now because I'm helping them out I basically at this point I'm just writing and uh, but I wasn't during that year and a half I was doing some consulting and, and doing work and 
man, it just, it just life. It's so annoying. I wish all I had to do was write. <laughs> now, do and, you find that as an escape, your writing? Because I know my daughter and, well, my family in general has had a lot of death that um, we've had to be acquainted with in the past couple of years. And as well as a lot of illnesses that just literally it takes the, you know, wind right out of you. And I find that writing is my escape and kind of like the sanctuary that will, will, when I'm with, with them, I can be fully focused. Whereas if I didn't have my writing, I don't, I don't know if I would be able to be, you know, that wine would be looking pretty good at this point. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's yes. all I think to myself is, you know, thank God my writing, you know, is my heart, you know, because I can write through a lot of the pain, discomfort, fears, everything. Well, I would say yes and no. Um, so in any book that I've written, mm -hmm. um, which is what, five now, I guess, five books, on every one of them, there were parts that were harder to write, right? I mean, some parts come easy. It's like, it's so clear in my mind and I'm just getting it out. And in other ones, it's, it's a struggle. And for those parts where it's going great, then yes, it's a huge refuge and release. But when I'm in a part that is hard, it's, it's coming slowly, then the stress and the emotional exhaustion makes it 10 times harder to get those parts done. And that's what happened a lot. Like the end of this book, that mean, there's a big, you know, there's a big battle and then some shit happens and then there's the wrap up, you know, and, and all of it was uh, hard to write. And then there was just so much stuff going on here. Mm -hmm. And then it, so it made it very, very hard. Um, so, I, I mean, and the, the problem is normally what I do is I have multiple projects that I'm working on at the same time. So if I get to a hard spot and I'm not inspired for it, I just go to another project and keep going. I, I usually have three or four. So I get to one that is like, yeah, you know, and I'm, and I'm, I'm firing. And then it's that great feeling and the drug rush, you know, you're just mm. the high, the writing high. But I couldn't do that because I had to finish this stinking draft. I mean, I have other things to work on, but I, I had to ignore them because I, I must get this done. And that sucked. It's yeah, much, that it's, feeling of I had I need an ounce of control over something and you got you got to get it done. And I just, yeah, I, I couldn't that, escape yeah. this project. I had to keep working on it. And so normally I write a lot at night, but I've been so tired and stressed out from this. I'd get my wife goes to bed early. She gets up for work at like 4 a.m. So she goes to bed early. And I'd go to bed with her and then I'd get up and I'd come back and write. And lately I come in and I'm just exhausted from the stuff. And I, it was one night in five, I'd actually write something worth keeping. The rest of the time I'd, I'd read the news, you know, <laughs> check on Facebook, you know, all the distractions, but I would never get to any writing done. So. Well, my heart goes out to you. I, I definitely, I know where you stand. Now, what is it in this book that you've released that you find the best part that you can kind of give us a little hint on for viewers to be able to go and go, aha, this is what, this is that magic moment he was talking about. Oof. So in the third book that I finished the first draft of today, I mean, let's see, it, I mean, it, it wraps up the story, you know, the, the story, my, my story came about, <laughs> so I've always loved fantasy, mm -hmm. you know, I also write science fiction and just humor, but, but about, you know, I, I started reading fantasy in junior high uh, with Lord of the Rings and man, you know, I was hooked. 
And I mean, I read sci-fi a lot too, uh, but fantasy was always my favorite. And one day when I was in high school, I thought, you know what? In, in all these worlds, in the fantasy worlds, there's normally this pantheon of gods and there's no denying there's no, I mean, you don't have to take it on faith that there's a God. I mean, you'd have to be an idiot to deny the existence of the God. I mean, they manifest in front of you and, you know, so I thought, well, so there can't be any atheists, but what would the people who would be atheists do? You know, would they, would they just be like, well, <laughs> there are gods, we got to worship them. Or would they be like, well, I, I admit they're real, but, but fuck them. You know I mean? And so that is the, the conflict in underlying the first three books in this series is the, the people who deny the gods and they basically kill people who refuse to denounce the gods and turn away from the gods. And so it's been this war for centuries, although the, everybody thought they were defeated and now they're back. And so it, it basically wraps up that storyline. I mean, there is a, a, a climax where those forces are defeated. I mean, the book's called Destroyers of Cathaldi. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of in the title that what happens. <clears throat> but um, other than that, I mean, there's... So Dirk is the narrator, and he has a lot of family stuff. And I, I can't... I mean, I don't want to go into it. Because right. Family, but, but at the beginning of the first book, he's like you know, my father abandoned us when I was a kid and I'm not bitter about it, but then he talks about it all the time. And so he's really hung up. He's got some daddy issues and he, he eventually becomes estranged from, but before the first book starts, he's estranged from his whole entire family. And in the third book, I mean, in, in the second and the third book, there's a lot of growth in that area, but he, in the third book, it is resolved, I guess it's wrapped up. Um, and Maybe not in the nicest way, but but it is resolved. Um, now, in your yeah. world building, yes. what is their describe their world for us? Well, all right, the world itself is very you know classic fantasy. There are multiple races. Um, the there are three types of humans. There's the the Mindolans, they're gray skinned. They're the majority of the people. Uh, there's uh, a black race called the Orkin, and then there's the Cathaldi. They're they're not just the bad guys. They're also a different race. They're white because I hate myself. I don't. <laughs> um, and uh, and the funny thing is, I did all this like 30 years ago because I wrote the first draft of the first book in third person when I was really young. And and I I did like the story, but I didn't love the book, so I kept rewriting it until I tried this way, and then I actually did love it. So, um, and then there's elves and dwarves and and some other things, but those are the main main races. And um, the gods are real. They, I mean, people have have met the gods. I think three different characters during the trilogy meet a different god, uh, and and they, the, the churches have a lot of authority. Um, the technology level is low. I mean, you know, crossbow or a, a, a catapult is like, a, you know, high tech for them. Um, so, I mean, I would say the traditional kind of sense, the... Um, yeah, women are not equals in that society. I mean, it's very medieval, I guess. Do they have different languages or do they all speak generally the same language? Uh, all the humans speak the same language. Um, the elves and the dwarves, the different races have different languages, but the the humans are the majority of the population. Everybody speaks that. Um, and going back in history, uh, there was a time when the different um, humans, even of the same color, spoke different languages. 
-hmm. but then something happened and that they were they were forced to migrate and everybody kind of settled on one language a common language but now how many who do you see as the hero in this story or how me. many heroes do you have me for writing the story you all right we <laughs> gotta give you a hand <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i think the there are a group of people you know working together um dirk dirk definitely sees himself as the hero mm -hmm. um but obviously nothing can be done by just one guy, you know, fighting a race of people. Um, but he is pretty central to the events because because it's first person, you know, I mean, if he's not there, then it's just people talking about what happened. And that's not the most exciting stuff. So, I mean, he's really there for everything. Um, he's got his fingers in it all. Um, so, yeah, I think he's the hero. I mean, is he a thief and a dick? Sure, sure. You know, yeah, he's true. not perfect, but uh, is he really sexist? Yes, he's not racist though, mm. and he tells you that often in the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh crap! I crack myself up. I'm just telling you. <laughs> I think the book's hilarious. So now let's explore one thing. When it comes to writing, what is your Achilles' heel? And remember, you're you're the fantasy man. So with those who do not write fantasy or e the people who are even thinking of writing fantasy, what would you, what would you tell them about fantasy? What's what's your your key? To All right, well, those those are a couple fantasy. different questions. Uh, I would say first my Achilles heel about <laughs> about writing is that I'm too interested in too many things. So like I have a gigantic garden and I grow way too much food. Um, and so for example, I, I had 105 potato plants this year, which gives you between 600 and a thousand potatoes. And then I had 72 stalks of corn, which gives you 144 or so ears of corn, ridiculous amount of food. And then I, process it so we have like three freezers full of stuff from the garden um and then you know we can stuff we dehydrate stuff and then we make everything from scratch so like we make our own crackers um we make all our own breads we make our own uh, i make my own bisquick you know to make um like biscuits or pancakes with we make our own tortillas and everything. So ridiculously time consuming. And then I also love restoring and working on old cars. So I'm like my worst enemy. If I would just buy a can of freaking chili instead of spending six hours making chili where I make my own chili powder, even, I would have so much more time to write. Um, so that's my Achilles heel. So I, I'm too stinking interested. I have a list of like, 40 dishes that we want to make you know and we we volunteer for this um america's test kitchen i don't know if you ever heard of them but they we we test recipes for them <laughs> so nice. we're very into food so that's the first thing um and then like writing fantasy or science fiction versus just writing like humor um for me, the world building is huge, although uh, my one science fiction book I wrote with a friend, it's called uh, You Get What You Steal. All my books are about thieves, apparently. Um, so don't read anything into that. But, <laughs> um, but so, so You Get What You Steal was different. We didn't sit down and create the world. We did it as like an exercise, like this was in the olden timey days um, mm -hmm. where most people didn't have a computer. I had a typewriter and my friend and I, we would take turns sitting at the typewriter and we would type one page, double spaced. And when you reach the end of the page, you're like, you're it. And then the next guy, you know, my friend Robin, he would sit down and type the page. And then when he was done, it was me. And he might, we might write each other into a corner. 
we might be right in the middle of something and we would, but we didn't say anything. We just left. I mean, you basically left the room and the, the other guy would write. And that was fascinating, but no world building at all. So it is much goofier. You know, the, the fantasy trilogy, the Cataldi Chronicles are a serious epic fantasy just told by a smart ass. And he insults people either in his head or to their face. And he makes a lot of, you know, snide comments. But, but it's not a goofy trilogy. I mean, it, it's, you know, life or death. It's, it's serious stuff. But you just get this smart ass talking about during the whole thing. The fantasy book is, or the science fiction book is goofy. So there wasn't a lot of world building there. Any other science fiction that I write that isn't that book with that friend, I would treat like fantasy though. And I mean, I have so much about the individuals, the religion, you know, the, 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 the structure of the pantheon, the, the how each city and country and church picks their leadership and who you know how long that leadership tends to last is it a, is it a really solid traditional you know conservative group or is it a you know every six months there's a new leader and um so i have a ridiculous amount of history and just stupid information that may never make it into any story but helped me figure out where everything was going to go because I did a lot of that before I ever figured out what the, who the Cathaldi were or what the gist of everything was going to be. I was just making notes and this was 30 years ago. So I had a gig, I still have a gigantic binder full of how much does stuff cost in this city? <laughs> you know what I mean? Just weird shit. <laughs> um, and for me, that makes a big difference. And, and I, so I'm in a bunch of Facebook writers groups and they're, uh, there's a, a a young lady in one of them and she would either ask a question or somebody else would ask a question and she would answer it. And her world building was so detailed. I'm like, I got to read her book because this is so much more detailed than mine. It makes me feel lazy. And I bet her book is going to suck because it's just going to be a bunch of facts about the world. And I was wrong. It was an amazing book. <laughs> and I'm a fan of hers now because I think that is really miraculous. She, because mm -hmm. hers was science fiction. It is, everything is so alien, but sometimes you read <clears throat> or I read uh, a piece of science fiction and I think the alien world is so alien. It's hard to wrap my head around and, and I don't feel like I'm in the world mm -hmm. and she avoid she avoided every trap it was very impressive but I, yeah anyway i guess i would say to boil it down <laughs> to a short answer a lot of world building is important what would your advice be to a new author well i have a lot of little things you know like um read a lot you know i, be, I a lot of people say that i believe that you, you need to read um, and not just whatever genre you're going to write, but just a lot, you know, you need to expose yourself to things that, I mean, when I was a kid and I wrote, I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. You know, I mean, you can't, you haven't lived it all. And so read as much as you can, of course, do some living, get out of your house, you know, have a relationship, you know, all that stuff. But, um, but I think the biggest piece of advice, which I, I read in like a, a Stephen King on writing book and, or essay was finish the first draft, man. I mean, your brain plays tricks on you and you're writing and you get to one of those parts that isn't so fun or inspired and your brain would be like, you know, it also be a great story is this. And you can't quit what you're doing. You, you just take a second, write down what the idea is and then get right back to the current work and finish it. Even if you're just going to throw it away, you have to establish the habit of finishing things. Um, and so I'm a firm believer in that. I, my first draft can be garbage. It doesn't matter. I have to get it out. And then, and then I'm willing to rewrite. I mean, that's not my most favorite thing to do. But, you know, for me, it is very important to finish stuff. And 
don't go back. I, I have a friend actually uh, who, you know, when you tell people you're writing or that you write, then they tell you everything they've written, you yeah. know, and this gets like, ah, I've been writing this book for five years. <laughs> and I'm like eight chapters in, I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, I, I just I keep rewriting it. Rewriting. I'm like, don't do that. Forget that. Finish the first draft, then start rewriting. What are you doing? You know, I mean, five years and you're eight chapters in. So that's my advice. Don't, don't try and make it perfect. Try and get it done and then go and make it as close to perfect as you can. Definitely. I love that. Now, how can readers reach you? My phone number? No, I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> um, the easiest thing is to go to my website, uh, www.cathaldi.com, K-A-T-H. A-L-D-I.com. That's got my links to Twitter and Facebook and my email address and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And I love when people contact me. I mean, I wish that happened more that, um, that people contacted me. Um, it's, you know, I, I'm not in a position where I'm making tons of money from writing. So the thing that keeps me going is like people going, Oh, I, you know, I enjoyed what you wrote or your audiobook or whatever. And so please reach out. Well, I'm reaching out right now and giving you, giving you the, the 411. I want to know about those potatoes. I want to know. Guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So become my Facebook friend uh, because I, for most of the summer and fall, I did a daily garden picture and talked about something from the garden um, because I'm insane. That's I mean, awesome. I love it. Oh, there's a lot of garden talk on there. <laughs> and you, you, you think I'm joking, but I never turned down dinner invitations. And the idea of that many potatoes, you need help. You need okay. help. And I can give you oh, Italian recipes. You, you would, you trust me, could use every potato. Oh my God. I love, love new it. recipes. Yeah. I love new recipes. We, I, on Facebook, I was like, what should I make? And I got some great suggestions for things mm -hmm. that I, uh, and I've made all but one of them, I believe so far, which was like, it was like Peruvian potato pancakes. And I haven't gotten to that yet, but. Very nice. Yeah. Well, I wish you well. And thank I you. thank you so much for joining us tonight. My pleasure. And like I said, anytime you're free, hit me up. Thank I'll bring you. my fork. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Definitely. I am Opus Knight, and you have entered Night Vision. And I thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. And Ron, I wish you all the best, love. It was thank wonderful you. seeing you again. Great to see you. Talk soon. Yes. Bye-bye now.